thanks for the opportunity to speak. Um, pleasure to be here. So as you can probably see, I'm both an engineer and an orthopedic surgeon, which means that I'm a bit of a car buff. They teach you that in orthopedic school. And I usually open this talk with an analogy. Uh, when you buy a car, you can go to Car Cost Canada and figure out exactly how much that car costs the dealership. You can go to Consumer Reports and figure out what the resale value is, how reliable it is, all those kinds of things. When I first started in practice, I had a difficult time telling my patients how long they would wait for their hip or knee replacement surgery, uh, how likely they'd be to be satisfied with the result, would they have a complication, how long would they be in hospital for. And that was sort of the genesis for us starting to look at measuring some of these uh, outcomes and reporting on them. And I think, Heather, hopefully I can check off all 14, 14 boxes, I think it is. Uh, 13, 12, 15. Um, <laughs> maybe I can check off 12 of them uh, that we learned kind of through brute force and trial and error. So let me get going here. So I chair our, it's now a, a provincial hip and knee replacement registry. So I, I chair the standards committee for the province now for orthopedics and um, I help run our registry, so it provides a good feedback loop. So this is the structure of our registry. We keep track of all of the elective hip and knee replacements that go in in the province now. We have both preoperative and postoperative data. The preoperative data, do I have a laser pointer on here? No, I don't. The preoperative data is collected in the pre-admission clinic, the PAC unit. So we have a consent form, a comorbidity scale, the patients fill out a medical comorbidity, diabetes, hypertension, so forth an uh, MSK comorbidity scale, so do you have a sore back, sore other hip, sore knee, those kinds of things. And of course an Oxford 12 hip or knee score, which is a joint specific score. It has six questions on pain and six questions on function. And then a generic health rated quality of life score called the SF12. And it can give you a mental component summary and a physical component summary. That's all collected in the pre-admission clinic. You notice there's no surgeon involvement there. Uh, in the OR, we fill out the uh, Canadian Joint Replacement Registry form. That's actually filled out by the nurses in the, in the OR. They put the stickers on, diagnosis and so forth, and it is confirmed by the surgeon. And then on a yearly basis, uh, we have sort of two data sources. One is the yearly mail out to patients one year after surgery. We repeat the Oxford 12 hip or knee score. We repeat the SF12. And we also ask them a very simple question. How satisfied are you with the results of your left hip replacement? And the question runs from very unsatisfied, unsatisfied, neutral, satisfied, and very satisfied. We also ask them about complications and whether or not they've had a revision operation. We also collect data from uh, medical records, so transfusion, length of stay, 30-day mortality, um, and readmission. And we collate all this data and generate a report on a yearly basis that's given to both the surgeons uh, and the sites. Uh, they have their data and they have their peers' data so they can benchmark themselves. And this is reviewed by our, it's now a Provincial Orthopedic Standards Committee. And the rules we have around outliers is if, you, if your data is uh, different from your peers for two or more years, you receive a letter from the Standards Committee asking uh, you to help us understand why your data is different from your peers. The other thing that we learned with this is to have surgeons acknowledge the receipt of their report. You send it out, you think they've got it and they've read it and you ask them six months later, oh, I never saw that. So we now ask them to acknowledge receipt and to tell us what they might address and if they need to address things. So I think I've just sort of summarized this. This is the feedback process. We also use this as the quality assurance for our central intake for hip and knee arthroplasty. So we implemented central intake for hip and knee in 2012. Uh, so if you're a primary care provider and you've got a patient with a sore hip or knee that might need to have a new joint, you fill out a one-page referral form, send it to our 1-800 number, and this is the quality assurance mechanism to make sure that all surgeons who are participating in that have good outcomes. So here is a sample report. Uh, so we've gone through several iterations, ranging from you know pages and pages of data that was undecipherable to something I think is a little easier to understand. And there's two things here. One is the quality indicators. That's the graph on the left-hand side, a spider chart. And the other is the case mix on the right-hand side. And the case mix there, of course, is to address those concerns. Well, I always operate on the largest patients, the oldest patients, the sickest patients. So my patients are different from everybody else's, and that's why my outcomes are different. And lo and behold, patients are not different. So we have uh, their volume of primary knees, 
overall patient BMI, their age, and their gender. On the left-hand side, um, we have several measures there. So um, we've laid this out. So there's the red line graph in the middle, uh, and that is the peer group kind of normalized to 50. So if this surgeon's data, which is in the blue line, is outside of that red line, that means their data is worse than their peers. If it's inside that line, you can, it's better. So you can see that in this example here, the surgeon's transfusion rate was higher than their peers. So if they, if they go down to the data, and I wish I had a laser pointer here, but I don't, there's two columns there, your data and the peer data, and you can see the surgeon's transfusion rate was 10% compared to their peers of 6.5%. We actually, we test this statistically, and it's significant at a p-value of 0 0.02. Uh, so this is the annual report that the surgeons get. Sites get the same data. Uh, and they also get, thank you very much, perfect. Right. Uh, I probably don't need it now for the next slide. <laughs> uh, so what I thought I'd do is just go through some of the data that we've seen over the past year. So I'm reporting here from 2006. I'm going to use it because you gave it to me. Uh, 6, 7 to 12, 13. And this is really sort of when we saw the changes in things. So this is the preoperative Oxford 12 score. And, you know, many orthopedic surgeons will tell you their interactions with uh, administrators. They aren't always positive. It's getting better. Um, you know, we've got long wait lists for hip and knee arthroplasty. So we find more money. We give it to the surgeons to do more joints. You guys do more joints and you still have long waiting lists. Are you finding normal people to operate on? Where are all these people coming from? So you can look at this kind of good data and say, well, look, this is the preoperative disease severity score, preoperative oxygen 12 score of our patients, and it hasn't changed in this six-year period. It's between 42 and 43. A significant difference is five points. So this, is, this is stable preoperative disease severity, so we're not operating on different patients. Uh, here's some length of stay data, and this is, you know, this is typical across Canada, uh, and this is not just from us reporting it in the registry. This is from many different initiatives to reduce length of stay. So a significant decrease in length of stay since we implemented the registry, and this has continued down we're probably around three days for hips and knees now. Uh, this is self-report whether or not they received treatment with antibiotics in the year following their hip or knee replacement surgery. So fairly stable, perhaps a downward trend. Uh, in hip arthroplasty. Uh, this actually caused me to change my uh, suturing technique because you can get something called a stitch abscess if the knot is too superficial in the incision. And I've seen my data change with this. Uh, here is transfusion rates. Uh, we had some initial uh, data quality problems. You can see that transfusion rates were not around 30%. They had some coding issues in medical records. Uh, we implemented a region-wide uh, blood conservation group. We saw some decrease in transfusion rates. And you can see this, this drop once we started including transfusion rates in the surgeon's reports. And we're now down below 5% for both uh, hips and knees. This is improvement in Oxford 12 score. So again, this is a disease-specific score, hip or knee. Um, and we've seen an overall increase of about two points in hips uh, and about one and a half points in knee. So this is the improvement in score. So uh, hip patients will have an improvement of 25 points after their hip replacement, and knee patients about 17 points. And this improvement has trended upwards over the past six years. And I think this is the indicator that really causes the most amount of discussion and change because it means something to patients and it means something to surgeons. And this is the simple question, how satisfied are you with the results of your left hip replacement? I have one minute left. This is on my last slide, I think. Um, and so we've had an increase. So we're about 95% for hips now and 85% for knees. This is the highest I've seen in any registry around the world. And we had a couple of outliers here uh, that were outliers for a couple of years. So our standards committee actually sat down with them uh, and developed a plan to address that. Some surgeons decided to stop doing knees. Other surgeons did some CME. And we've had an increase in satisfaction rate. <laughs> We've looked at the correlation between satisfaction and outcomes. We know that an improvement in functional score and a lack of complication is, ver is tied very strongly to being satisfied. And I would almost make the argument now that we can probably stop measuring Oxford 12, SF12, and simply ask the patient, are you satisfied with the results of your surgery, yes or no? 
And the other important thing here is uh, reduction in revision rate. So this is the uh, two-year revision rate. So if you have to have your hip or knee revised, redone within two years, that's probably, a, it is a strong indicator of, you know, it's gone in crooked, you had an early infection, something bad happened. So we've seen a significant reduction in revision rate uh, since we implemented it. And this is significant cost savings, both for the patient. It's awful to have to have your hip or knee revised but it's also significant savings to the system. And one of our challenges really has been reinvesting these savings into doing these kinds of initiatives and even providing more care for patients. So that's my spiel, and I'd be happy to entertain questions during our question and answer period here, I think. Thank you very much.